Thank you for being on the show, man. Yes, bro. It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure, man. This is yeah. uh, really grateful to be here in LA in, uh, where are we, Bev- Beverly Hills? In Beverly Hills. All I can think about is Beverly Hills Cop. Every <laughs> yeah. time I see that, I think of Eddie Murphy's cheesy grin. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always surreal, man. Mm. From f- being out in Beverly Hills and everything that it represents. Um, yeah, it feels like a... It, sometimes feels like a bit of a juxtaposition to be out here, you know what I mean? And to be... feels both completely normal mm. and um, and fucking surreal. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? To, to, so we're a long way from the manor. <laughs> a long, long, yeah. long way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is different. It is different, I mean. But yeah, really, really good. So yeah, thanks for being on. My pleasure, really man. It. Really My pleasure. It. I've listened to the... I've listened to... Um, Loads of episodes while I've been out here this last couple of days while I've been driving around doing meetings and stuff. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing. It's something positive mm. and, um, you know, it's obviously for the culture, but it's also something kind of constructive and positive. And yeah. um, that's everything I'm about. Um, Absolutely. So I salute you, man. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to just dive into your story a bit. Mm. Um, I just want to get a sense of how, how you started. So... How did it all start for you? Did, was it um, you growing up in Camden, North London? Was performing arts like a part of your early life, or was no. it in like, your household? No, not at all. I mean, like I'm one of five brothers and sisters, so there was kind of like a competitive edge all the time to yeah. get attention and to like you know it was a where, loud. Where do you place. sit in your siblings? Are you like middle? I am middle. Yeah, yeah middle, lower middle. Um, Same as me. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, I don't know. I think it's like a quite a humble place to be. Mm. You know, you feel kind of. Uh, I think there's a good duality to feeling kind of like insignificant, somewhat, mm. and also like you know, um, but having enough love and stuff to have felt special. But like at the same time, just like not being like having maybe the arrogance of the eldest <laughs> or the victim mentality of the youngest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying. And to, to to sit in the middle, so um, you know, but I think you can put a positive and a negative spin on everything. So that's my positive spin on that. But um, so yeah, there was a you know, it was quite a competitive environment, energy wise, and we were all very kind of energetic, young right, young right. young siblings. So that was like you know, we were encouraged to be creative. Like I used to love drawing. Mm. I was listening to the Blind Boy podcast the other day and he was talking about, you know, think about what made you happy when you was a kid. What was like the happiest you were? And I was thinking back, I was thinking when I used to sit down and just draw with my brother and we would just draw like, we used to do these things called Silly World Wars where we'd just have like stick men jumping out of planes and (laughs) parachutes and all that. And we used to design houses and like what we'd do to the garden shed if we could make it our own. Yeah, like, yeah. It me and my work. brother did the exact yeah. same thing, actually. <laughs> but I think it's funny that, you know, and there's something humbling in the fact that, like, we probably all had such similar fucking experiences, mm. um, no matter how um, different, you know, our, 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 all of our upbringings may have been in some ways. Like, there's a, there's, there is such a thing as a human experience as yes. opposed to the Ryan or the Ed experience. Right. Um, that we kind of should appreciate more and maybe then we would have a bit more empathy and love for each other and the, the notion of otherness would be would kind of dissipate somewhat. Mm. But um, yeah, I never really like, I never wanted to act, that's for sure. I never thought about it, I never did acting in school, never did, um, yeah, never just had any... That was never part of desire, you yeah. know, not at all. Like I, I, I found an art teacher in in, in secondary school, Miss Snowsill. Um, at the school I went to, Fortismere, that was just amazing, and she just really, um, she made me feel special. She mm. made me feel like I had something there, and she made me, for the first time of any of my teachers, I kind of felt like I was really good at something. Right. And that was like year nine or something. Um, and so, you know, from that point, I was doing mad shit, like staying in lunchtime mm, and like and coming drawing. back after school to finish <clears> off <throat> paintings and stuff, which is like unheard of, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> We're sure. not doing that. Definitely not. And um, <laughs> not and never did that in any other subjects ever. Yeah. And so art became this thing, mark making, you know, um, I became obsessed with like Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, mm. Keith Haring, Cy Twombly, 
David Hockney. Um, and then opened up to this world of like this conceptual conversations about art and, and, and all of that and kind of found that like linguistically and orally and mentally it was something which like really clicked with me. I used to like debating about stuff and you know, I was in my, my art class wearing like the you know, my, my tracksuit bottoms halfway down my ass, thinking of weed, my head shaved two cubic zirconia earrings in, in <laughs> one in each earlobe <laughs> probably were, you know from yeah, H. Samuels and were green or whatever <laughs> like wearing a wife beater you know debating with them about you know Mark Rothko and, and, yeah, and yeah. Chuck Close or whatever and, and you know debating with people um, with, uh, from different sub uh, subcultures and different groups and different mm. uh, social and and, and uh, demographics and such so you know it was like a really eye-opening thing for me and a kind of transferable creative skill that 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 art and painting gave me very early on mm. in in the sense of like mixing with people outside of my group you know it wasn't just people that were into two-step garage and jungle and hip-hop and yeah yeah you know people that were just playing football smoking weed and playing pro evolution mm -hmm. you know and it's like as much as that was my kind of tribe at the time that was like um I also found that, like, I loved, yeah, like I said, I love, like, debating conceptual shit in art and getting pretentious and, and wanky with it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, discussing, like, a drip down the middle of a painting and what it could mean and all right. of this. Like, I love that shit. So so that, that, that really opened things up. And then I started getting into music, the underground music scene. There was an amazing time. This was, like, just before the digital era. So it was still, like, the record shops and that. And I was a DJ. I used oh, to right. collect vinyls, still got a massive vinyl collection, all the um, predominantly hip hop, mm. predominantly it started with US hip hop um, and then it became uh, all the UK hip hop, Skinny Man, Kalashnikov, Task yeah. Force, you know, Jess, the golden era um, or one of the golden eras. Um, of, of of UK hip hop for sure, and was a real part of that. And you know, the the, the time when you had when you know we were making mixtapes on cassettes. Yeah. We was making yeah. then we made mixtapes on CDs. Even mini discs came in for yeah, me mini discs for, for a couple of years. To that era, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then it's like you know, handing out flyers, putting up fly posting ourselves, getting nicked for it, and all that, and yeah. you know, putting on nights and, and and all of this. So that kind of gave me an entrepreneurial kind of street entrepreneurial hustle and drive mm. that I was able to kind of tie in with my um, creative conceptual um, the. the things that I'd unlocked in the art world, you yeah. know? And it was exciting, man. Mm. You know, it was exciting. I, you know, it, 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 you had to be at these raves to know about these raves and... Um, yeah, because this is before social media yeah, really yeah. hit. The subcultures were... Um, you know, you had to work hard to be a part of them. Yeah, you had to and craft, therefore man. you were you were the only people a part of them because if you went to a task force gig with 500 people at that Friday night, you know, no one was filming that and if they were it was for some shitty fucking VHS they were yeah, selling yeah. dark and cold on the weekend mm -hmm. or whatever. It wasn't on the internet on Snapchat on Insta or whatever. So it was just you so you really felt a part of it. So there was this kind of sacred um feeling that we had about the UK hip hop scene. Um, at the time and it was it was it was a, a wonderful time you know I truly look back and think what an amazing time it was creatively mm, for sure um, and then you know throughout all that time I was friends with um, Ben Drew Plan B yeah I was gonna I was gonna pick up on that yeah, yeah. Um, who's indirectly a, a, a link to us two as well yeah yeah um, as he is to so many people he's a super clue that's brought so many people yeah, yeah. together you know the creative culture and society needs people like him mm. um outliers to, to to lead the way for sure and he led a lot of us um and inspired a lot of us and 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 you know me myself uh and nick and sean and sega and a lot of us we all follow um a lot of his footsteps and learn a lot from him and owe a lot to him and so you know i owe more than most or anyone in the sense that like he was always writing scripts and um, he wrote a script for a short film 
and was just like, yeah, I want you to be in it with Adam Deacon, who was like a big actor at the time. Yeah, like 2008. Yeah. Coming off of kid adulthood. Kid adulthood, all yeah. of that. It was like, you know, it was big, man. And, mm. you know, that, that kind of Noel Clark era was beginning. Yeah, and doors were opening. Doors for, were opening. For that kind of content to be shown on the big screen. Yeah, opening, but they had been very stylized. So we had this Guy Ritchie era as well, yes. which was, you know, incredibly stylized and wonderful in many ways, but not necessarily representative of, of, of the London that we mm. all grew up in. Certainly the different colours and, you know, heritage and yeah. culture that we grew up in. So, um, so anyway, cut a long story short or make a long story longer. <laughs> ben... Um, Ben cast me in this short film. We shot it. We got funding for a feature. We shot that in 2010 for 150 grand, Ill Manners. Yep. Um, and then we came back in 2011 because he made he, he, Strickland Banks did so well that he he got another 150 grand off someone to fix the movie because it's a bit of a mess. And that was. That I was, was in the studio with Ben at that time. At he Rack. Was, uh, at oh, Rack, yeah. yeah, at Rack and um, the, the, the Windy House. Right. When he was, at the same time, recording his album and editing the movie. He had, he had the and editors losing there. losing his fucking mind. Losing his mind. Yeah. It's like, how are you doing this? This yeah. is two massive projects. We probably met there the first time because I was probably. up there, yeah. Probably. I remember coming through there with my, my baby and... Um, yeah. Probably. I mean, was there, enough was there. people there, but there were so many people there at the time. Yeah, it was yeah. amazing. Creatively, it was amazing. Again, super glue. You know, there was like so many people working, and and Ben was just someone that brought people in and believed yeah, yeah. in people. He's and definitely someone that can spot potential and talent, mm. and he really does put his uh, money where his mouth is. In that sense, where he will put people in a position mm. to show what their worth is, mm. and that's that's we need, like you said, we need people like that. We need people <coughs> like that, and. Um, most people ain't like that and mm. they kind of close off the door and, and, and they hoard, you know what I mean, rather yeah, than yeah. share and, and there is enough to go around and, and, and ben, ben has shown us that, man. For sure. Just so, to go back, yeah. um, when you, so you released an EP in 2004. Yeah, I released 2004. a couple, man. I released yeah. vinyls and mixtapes, EPs, all and, of uh, that. You released an album in 2007, was it? Or 2000? Yeah, yeah, 2007. Something like that. Which Ben was on, Plan B. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've done like a kind of a conscience guilty um, conscience, guilty kind conscience of vibe. Yeah, yeah. yeah well we actually wrote a whole album of that oh really yeah we actually had like a 20 track album written out we like used to just characters. meet up and um get a bottle of jack daniels ben's favorite drink yeah at the time <laughs> yeah yeah at the time <laughs> um yeah bottle of jack bottle of coke oh, jesus that's so unhealthy and i think we used to do that <laughs> all the time and then um yeah and then we'd drink that, write, record, and then drive home our separate ways. Yeah, yeah. And you just think, oh my gosh, what idiots. Or like, Man. you know, how lucky we are that nothing ever happened to us mm -hmm. or nothing. Um, or we never got caught. But um, it was amazing creatively, man. Me and him used to, we've always been each other's creative confidants. And um, you definitely need that. Yeah, we, you do need that, man. Like, I heard someone say something really interesting the other day when they were talking about mentors, and they were saying, like, all of us should have um, a mentee. Yes. An equal and, and a mentor. mentor. Mm. And I love that. And I, and I thought about it, and I actually thought about it the other day, and I was like, I have a lot of equals mm. that, I, that, I, that, I, that I can speak with and I do speak with and I need to soundboard things off. And I have a lot of uh, young people that I mentor through my charity work. Um and then I was like, but who mentors me, man? Mm. So that's something this last six months I've kind of been focusing mm. on and, and um, you know, been kind of thinking about that and thinking, you know, exactly what I need and what, what is, or what I might need or what is realistic as well and, yes. and how yeah. these kind of, the kind of dynamic might work. And, and it's certainly something which I'm, which I'm kind of open to the universe showing me, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and, and kind of wait and, and exploring the possibility of and, mm. and, and have that question but haven't got the answer yet. Yeah, I mean, I've had a similar, um, I've, I've been in a similar position where you do have equals and you have people that you're constantly like giving knowledge to and you're thinking, but who, who am I modelling myself on, mm. you know? Um, 
And sometimes the answer isn't what you would imagine it to be as well in terms of, so for example, with, with yourself, it might be a, an actor who's been in a game for decades mm. and is constantly refreshing themselves and things like that. But sometimes the mentor you need isn't that person. Mm -hmm. It's just someone else that comes out of left field mm -hmm. that gives you the knowledge that you didn't even know you needed, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what, that's what I got, which was amazing. Yeah, I think about that. Uh, and when I think about that, that was the thing that made me think, maybe I have got these mentors already because I've got these, like, a couple of women in my life that are, like, my English agent, mm -hmm. Kate Buckley. Um, there's an amazing uh, lady called Marnie Rose who's always been a big part of my life in my kind of previous lives and such. And yeah. um, they're, like, my my moral sounding boards they're the people that I really listen to and respect more than they even know maybe mm. um, and so yeah they and they don't necessarily they you know they have different experiences from me in different realms and jobs like you say but morally they're people that I look to yeah. and look up to and they are people with experience and um, yeah, and I love them to bits. So you know, they are. I think they. I think those two kind of f fill that position. Definitely, somewhat. I think as well. Like people have the tendency to think that a mentor needs to be older, for example, mm. or look like them, or be exactly like them, like mm. a different model of them. Mm. But sometimes your mentor can be someone who's younger mm. than you, who's someone who's more experienced in a, in a field or, or whatever. Like mm. A mentor could be could be anyone, mm. really. It depends you know? what we're mentoring each other in, man, because mm. it's like, you know, this marathon, like, we're all running multiple marathons, you know, the family marathon, the uh, money marathon, the creative yeah. marathon, the uh, moral marathon, the health marathon, whatever. And we're all at different stages on those things, you mm. know, and I can mentor you on that, on that, on one of them, you yes. know. Yes but like other ones you need to mentor me on, mm. you know? And I suppose that's like the best thing that I've felt recently about like mm, the changing notions of like masculinity and brotherhood and um, my changing understanding of these things and the changing in the connections of me and my boys and, and, and the kind of support mm. um, structure that we have for each other and the evolving dynamic from being, you know, most of my boys I knew when I was a kid, let alone teenager, let alone 20 year old, let alone 30, let alone now 36. So, you know, we've all evolved and become different animals along the way. And so it's like, it's a beautiful thing now when I think about the, the conversations I have with my bros, yeah. with my boys and how positive um, and helpful and constructive so many of them are and how supportive we are for each other and and, and what, what a kind of positive network that I and we have created around ourselves um, is like something really to be proud of and something that I, I really value and is really gives me the kind of grounding that I need to come out here by myself and, 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 and eat it up that's a good point that's a good point man like in terms of yeah feeling grounded and you don't, you're not coming out here searching for anything else than what you're focused on. 100%. You know, I think being grounded and having an anchor back home is like the secret thing or the not so secret weapon of mine. And it's like, yeah. I think that this is a job that dissipates um, your energy in so many ways. It dissipates you geographically. You know, I'm here now, I've got to pop back to London and I'm going out to New York next week, you know. Um, who knows after that and, 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 and I'm kind of not in control of my geographical mm. status or whatever, my place on this planet um, and even inside that you know my timetable and stuff and, and, and all of this and it's like um, no matter how or jazzy sometimes things can be or how unglamorous things can be sometimes it is quite overwhelming and you have such a lack of control so me having this strong base, mm. this very grounded anchor back in London, back in East London, where I'm like, my home, my community, my family, my people, you know, my brothers, my sisters, blood and not blood, you know, m the network of people that I can pick up on the phone anytime, um, you know, inside the creative industry and outside. And it's like, you know, in some ways, 
it has been a conscious, concerted effort to build that and to create that yeah. nest, womb, hub around me so that, yeah, I can come out here and just be powerful mm. and focused and calm. Yes. So I was going to pick up on that, actually. Mm. Um, we're probably going to like dice around all of the, the different questions, but yeah. um, a couple of things from that. How do you, how do you balance? Um, or how do you like recalibrate when you go back to London? Like you're on sets, you're um, going into different characters and stuff, and then you're going back home into like normal life. How, what, what's, what's that like? I mean, like, I've got two kids, so there's a, there's a timetable that it goes on regardless of what, what, what headspace I'm in. Right. Whether I'm coming out of a psychopath or a racist or a it's military man, whatever it is, mm. like, wherever, whatever men, horrible men or positive mentality I'm coming off in my little dreamland, the kids have got to go to school. The kids have got to go to sleep at that time. They've got gymnastics. They've got swimming. Um, and that kind of, that is the most grounding thing you could ever Just do. brings you, you know? straight back. I get off the plane and I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, even tomorrow I know when I land, um, my aim is just to get back so I can do the pickup, you know, yeah, pick up my lovely. boy and then it's just that, you know. Um, How old are they, your, your, your kids? Uh, two and eight. Okay. Yeah, so um, almost two. And so, you know, that, that that's very grounding and there's nothing more grounding than, you know, having to wipe someone's ass four <laughs> times a day and while well, they're screaming at you yeah. or, or whatever and, you know. Um, and See, then they, you don't got, even have the chance to recalibrate. It's just there. Like the no, mode, the mode just changes. It, it does. It does. And it's the reality that I want to plug myself back into, and that is yes. like what I am thinking of while I'm out here. Even while I'm out here, I feel like you know, I understand intellectually the positive reason for me being out here. I understand how I, I'm very grateful. Uh, I understand what I'm doing out here, finishing off a job that needed to be finished that I've already, you know, had signed up and been paid for already last year. So it's like finished one movie off and then all these meetings and everything to, to, to you know, speculate for future works and such. Mm. You know, this is like power moves that I need to do. However, I have to wrestle with like the moral side of me, which is like, as nice as it is here, I kind of just wish I was at home changing nappies, doing a school run, Yeah, you know? But it's like, um, you know, I, again, intellectually, I understand that we all need to work and, and I need to pay the mortgage and all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 the calibration is quick, you know, and then it's all the family and all my friends there and everyone just cusses me as soon as I get back anyway, <laughs> you know. My mum cuts me downside before you know it and, yeah. and, and my pals, you know, there's no, there really is no um, red carpet rolled out for me. Um, and I wouldn't want it that way anyway. No. We're, we're English, or rather, we're not even English. We're Londoners, so we, we're not really. That's not really our um, mo. Our bag, you know no. what I mean? We don't need that. We take whatever satisfaction from our work. We take, you know, we take it. We understand it. Um, we appreciate it, and um, and it is what it is. Yeah. And then it's like back to reality, you know. And also, it's like them lot of the fuel for the fire, you know. Re real life, you know, when I'm up there pretending to be all these people again, whether positive or negative, I'm just reflecting the reality that I'm analyzing and watching and living every day, mm. you know. So, the nuances of everyday life and real emotion, real human emotion, happy and sad good point. This is my food, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I can't be in the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills too much because I'm not seeing real life, I'm feeling real life while I'm out here. Mm. So for me to go back to the ends and, and, and plug back in and get back into reality, get back into the charity work and my mentorship and all that, you know, everything that's like real life and that's going on regardless of, like I say, what bubble I'm in, like it's, it's, it's important for me as an actor as well, you know, and if I can just technically and intellectually improve enough at the craft then I just need to keep myself plugged into real life and just keep noticing and understanding um, myself and the world around me even more. And, 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 and that's real life. Yeah, man. Yeah, you for know? sure. For sure. It's really good. It's really good. I just want to connect the dots. Mm. So you're working with Ben, Plan B, on mm. your album. Mm. And then uh, you mentioned that he, he was writing scripts. Mm. Um, the stuff that you did with him was quite like character-led in terms of the music. Yeah. Um, is that where he kind of 
spotted that oh you've got like acting potential because you said acting was yeah, never part of your I don't your know man he used to say to me I've got an actor's face and I thought that was such a <laughs> he presumptuous does, he does say thing those to things. say yeah, yeah. and I thought well, alright um, but Ben has these mad ideas and he's so fucking ambitious it's unbelievable um, it's infectious in fact where yeah. most of us kind of have, you know we either lived with the imposter syndrome my whole life and never thought it was good enough or we're just like more realistic and like yeah that might work but Really? Yeah. You're going to make a feature film? Like, you know, one step at a time, mate. Mm. Um, but he did it and, and he believed in me. And, 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 and the, the main thing was that I've always been brave. Like, I don't care about flopping. I, right. I would have just done it and just been crapping it and then just did one movie and then just been like, oh, well, that was fun, innit? And I did it with my bro. Right. You know, that I love to bits and that I trust and I go to war for. And he wanted me to do it. So I do it for him as much as anyone. Mm. And I even said to him halfway through the shoot, I was like, bro... I don't want to be an actor. I said, I'll just act for you. Every time you make a movie, I'll act for you. Yeah. And I'll be in your movies, innit? Um, but other than that, I don't want to be an actor. I said, this is too affecting, man. This is horrible. Like, you know, obviously the character in your manners was like horrible yeah. bastard. So I was just spending all day. You know, I'd get up. I was living in Dalston. I'd get up, I'd get picked up. And I'd drive through the... Hackney and, and Tower Hamlets and I'd see like homeless people fighting at five in the morning and people like smoking crack and skagheads and all that and, and then I'd go on set and do all this dark shit and it, I was just was living this dark uh, conceptual realm and because I was it was my first job I didn't really know how to separate now I know how to separate all right, day long right, right. <laughs> but back then I didn't yeah. so I said to him yeah I'm not doing this and you know, he looked at me with a kind of wry smile and he said just see how it goes you know mm -hmm. and then next thing um yeah his agent at the time um kate buckley uh in 2011 she saw a cut of it and she was like yeah i want to meet with that guy and um we met and 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 um my life just couldn't have changed more it's like crazy. it's crazy at the same time i'm exactly the same person yeah and everyone who knows me knows this just with a bit more hair on my head and um <laughs> yeah it's usually the other way around. Yeah, I know. <laughs> They're like, I thought you were bald. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I just, it's skinhead, isn't it? Everyone just used to have a skinhead and a fade or whatever. And I just was like, so lazy from like 12 years old until like 27. Yeah. Never grew my hair. And um, and then grew it now. Um, but yeah, no. Nah, so yeah, and then my, you know, my life has changed so much since, man. You know, life can change for the positive and negative every day. You know, we make one, one wrong decision today we get nicked and end up in the fucking American prison system for the next 20 years. Like our life changes in a moment, yeah. you know, that's for a negative example. But, but this truly was like, uh, with hard work and focus and discipline and, 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 and drive and a hell of a lot of luck. Like it's nuts. It's crazy. How everything has changed. It's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, at that, at that moment, you're like, I don't want to do this. But then mm. you start to get meetings and stuff like that. Mm. What what changed within you to kind of do it more? And well, I'm an opportunist, man. Mm. And like I said to him, I didn't want to do it when there was no agents knocking about. Ah. It, it? <laughs> as soon as the agent knocked about, I was like, "Ooh, oh, this looks well, cool. I've got an ins in it. I got I can try something, right. you know." Plus, like my life was like I was at a really dark, kind of low place at that point, like. It's interesting when, when I think about it, you know, it's 2019 now. In 2011, um, kind of similar to, to what I was listening to Risky Roads, talking about working as a cab driver. Yeah. I was a, a sports coach in the community, so I was an athletics and swimming coach. Mm. And I loved it, you know. Um, loved being a part of the community, loved teaching the kids, always loved sports and training and that. And... Um, and it just gave me the breathing space, like he said, that like I could do my creative endeavours and I never had to worry about my... I was never doing it for the money. I was doing it for the sacred reasons, you know yeah. what I mean? For the love. But then in 2011, I basically um, kind of got fucked over and ended up not being able to work. And really? Like being, yeah, like not having any money and was broke. My kid was like five months old. I had no job, no money, I was broke, I was so low. And literally, at my lowest point, that's when I got a text from Ben. Wow. So it was actually the next day. 
after it had all been made official. And I was so worried and scared. And um, I got a text from Ben saying, yeah, my agent wants to meet you. And then obviously it still took like another six, 12, 18 months of like the hustle and I was still broke. Still, course, yeah. these all tins from Morrison's in yeah. Stamford Hill every day. It was just like, yeah, it was broke and it was building things back up, trying to build up my coaching stuff while going to auditions and stuff. But so I suppose it was kind of just a, also a point in my life where like I had to fight for something. But, you know, I was also mm. 27 and like, I was like, oh, my, what? I'm starting again now. Now? Yeah. I'm like 27. What? But um, I'm, a, I'm a worker. I was raised as such. Like I'm a hard worker and disciplined and, and, and um, see things through. So. It was like, okay, I've got an opportunity. Let me yeah. try and do this. Go to this audition. Go to that audition. Try and get better. How do they do it? You know, um, make all the mistakes and just go for it. Gun ho, man. And I just had this kind of blind self-belief from the beginning. And this kind of gun ho attitude of like, I don't really give a shit. Mm. I don't really care. Like, I don't need this. Mm. But I've got this amazing opportunity and was getting sent up for like big auditions from the beginning that I was like, well, why would they give me this? <laughs> And then sometimes I'd get them yeah. and be like, oh, and it took a while for like the imposter syndrome to to go away. But like, you know, we're here, this is not that long ago that we're talking about. No. You know, I'd never met my English agent at that point in 2011 and certainly hadn't met my American agent who, who you know, who's changed my, my life as well. And, um, you know, all of my team since then, I've got an amazing lawyer out here. I've got an amazing account. And, you know, my team is strong. We are efficient. Mm. And we are good people. And I've amassed a team in my image of like positive, good human beings, morally good human beings, but people that are, are, are cold hearted with the business. Yeah. And get on Which with you it. you have to be. And just keep it simple, stupid. You know what I mean? Don't, 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 um, not a more, you know, professional and polite. And let's keep it moving. We, we don't need to burn no bridges. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, you know, when I think, when I sit here now looking at the palm trees out the window, on, on Doheny Drive and Beverly Hills and all of that, you know, I just think like, that's mad. Seven, Surreal, and, man. seven and a half years ago, I, was, I remember when I was sitting on the bench and with my mate Moody and I, and I got the text from Ben and it, it changed my life, you know? <sighs> and um, yeah, it's kind of crazy w w when you look at these things, when you look back with hindsight, hindsight is a luxury, isn't it? Mm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy when you look back, but like it is not that long ago that I was broke down and out. I'm not even thinking about being an actor. And then next thing you know, here I am, you know, and I'm writing, I'm directing, I'm developing stuff. And um, believe me, there is no more imposter syndrome. You yeah. know, I know my worth. I know what I can bring. I know how I can improve. And I know all the levels that I want to improve. And, and um, there's no arrogance. Um but I know my worth mm. and I know what I can bring and I know how much better I'm going to get and what a commodity I can be. So it's, it's just, it's the, it's, 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 it's the eat up. It's the eat up. It's, 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 it's munching time. Mm. And, um, yeah. Fully, fully. I yeah. fully get that. That's, that's an incredible story, man. And seven years, seven years. I'm doing my math wrong. Uh, eight years, eight years. Yeah. 11. Yeah. Eight years. That's crazy. A, man. That's an incredible story. So you're on, you're on a bench. And you get the text from Ben, and then that's that gave you the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and then he, yeah, like I say, from there it was still a long time till things started building up. And I was, and I built my teaching business back up, and carried on teaching until 2014. Good that was the other yeah. thing I really liked about what um, Rhodes was saying, because he was saying like, um, you know, having, having. That, that that alleviates a certain amount of anxiety. Yes, it you know, because really yeah. it's like we shouldn't be worrying about money when it and and wanting to do art for money. You know, I've never like wanted to do, you know, wanted to make. I've only taken projects on because I love the projects and because they'll make me improve. Mm. And then sometimes I'm like, and you're going to pay me what? <laughs> oh my God, you look crazy. I would have done it for 10% 10, 10 of the price. But right. anyway, lucky I'm not dealing with you. My lawyer is. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it's like Alex Ferguson used to say to his players, it's like, just work hard. Just work on kicking that ball and the money will come. Don't think about kicking the ball for money. Mm. 
because then you make money at 19 and you'll be broke by 21 and you'll be at, you know, you'll be playing for Preston North End by then. Yeah. No disrespect to Preston. Um, you know, and I always say it like, you know, I, I, I come in like the Gary Neville of, 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 of the game, like with less technique than other people, with yes. all of that, but with yeah, the yeah. hard working mentality. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. will work harder than you. I work harder than everyone. And I may end up being the captain. And when the best crosser in the world, David Beckham, retires, I may have learned so much from working with him yeah. that I may be almost an equal of crossing by the time <laughs> I finish, which is unbelievable, which is what he was like. That's right. So as much as I'm a Liverpool fan and Gary Neville is not one of our, our sons or favourite <laughs> sons or favourite people, I respect him and I respect yeah. his... his, his, um, his, his um, it's hard work, mm. you know, and I relate to that. I, I relate to that too. Yeah. I relate to that too. I think uh, you would know you have a certain amount of talent, but then you work with people that are just like, whoa, like yeah. they don't even try yeah. in that sense. But it's being self-aware and knowing that, look, I know that I can learn things mm. quite quickly, quite detailed, mm -hmm. as long as I put the hard work in, mm -hmm. you know, and once you know that over time, you're going to get the results, you know, but I think it's about being self-aware. hundred percent. It's the 10,000 hours, you know, yeah. the, the, the Malcolm Gladwell shit. And it's also like, you know, um, just trying to make, not just trying to spend blind hours on mm. getting better. It's about like really intellectually, analytically analyzing what I actually need for my job. What are the exact specifics of my job and what does it entail? Um, what are the obvious things I need to do? What are the extra things? What are the small percentages that I yes. can that I can play with? The, the the tiny things that I can do, which just make the the, the 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 hairline difference to it, but does make a difference, you know. Um, am I, you know, uh, and 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 then from there, when 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 you're doing that, then you can start to make power moves rather than just constantly working and draining yourself. And then it's like at a certain point, you just switch off and go, cool. You know, I've done enough. I can't mm. do any more for this. Now I can watch some dumb shit on Netflix yeah. or like, you know, switch off or do this or that. And so then you also get the yin and yang and you can, you know, you don't lose yourself in it. So, um, yeah, man, it's, 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 it's just, it's, there's a real focus on, on, um, you know, there's been luck involved in this, but there's been like untold focus and, 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 um, analyzing you create your your own luck as well with that like they say luck is when hard work meets opportunity yeah i like that so i like that you have to fulfill your side of the bargain yeah. do you know what i mean opportunities are going to pop up yeah but are you prepared for it yeah that's, that's the thing yeah yeah um so you've been cast as villains often mm. but yourself you're quite peaceful and quite mindful mm -hmm. um how do you how do you empathise with like a villain character? Mm, we grew up around a lot of bad people, innit? it? Yeah, a lot of people that on paper were not nice people and people you wouldn't want to be around. Mm. But we saw the nice side in you know, or or we were able to see an empathetic side. You know, we knew. Um, We saw that bad that the baddest people could still be the greatest uncle or the greatest friend or the greatest um even the greatest dad. Yeah. It seemed like it, you know. Yeah. Um, for a certain amount of time until it all catches up or, or whatnot. Um and we also know that the so called quote unquote best people and most positive people that we've seen the cracks and reality behind them. So it's just kind of having this objective, nuanced look at people and all of us, including myself. I don't demonize myself or love myself when I look in the mirror, but I see my ugly side and I mm. see um, what beauty I may be able to bring to this world objectively. So it's just about that, analyzing it, you know. Um, I mean, I enjoy it, man. Mm. I enjoy it. You know, I don't enjoy it in normal life. In normal life, all I enjoy doing is spreading love and yeah. smiles and hugs. You know what I mean? Um, and linking people together and, 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 and contributing to the community and society. But outside of that, um, when I'm playing, 
I want to be the most horrible bastard ever and do the craziest shit. Right, come right. on, man, this is the funnest yeah. shit ever. I want to be like Joe Pesci in Casino. Like, they, come on, stabbing him with the pen in the bar. Like, I would yeah. never want to do that in real life or even see that. Yeah. But I want to pretend to do that all day long. <laughs> so, you know, I do find these characters fun and I do enjoy them and I do seem to be able to um, humanize them somewhat. Mm. Um, you know, I also like playing positive characters and, and, and all of that, but um, yeah, it just, it's maybe my bone structure yeah. lends itself towards <laughs> and the, the accent as well. as well. And the accent. It seems like if you're a villain, you have to speak in a British accent for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Not, not you in particular, but yeah. like just generally in, in, in movies. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, man. yeah. It is an interesting dynamic. I haven't quite got to the bottom of I have this conversation on a lot of film sets. Really? Yeah. yeah. And I, I haven't quite got to the bottom of why that is. Maybe it's because it, for the majority of people, it just sounds different to them. So it doesn't sound yeah. as endearing. I don't know. Historically, British people have committed some horrific um, there's that too. <laughs> things morally as well. Yeah, yeah there's know, that too. Empire and such. Mm. This is, uh, traditionally, we have been the villains of, the, of history. It's a very good point. Um, especially the well-spoken white man. Yeah. So that, that may have something to that do with it. That might have something to well. do with it. <laughs> yeah. For real. So you're a self-confessed comic book geek. Yes. Yes. Um, what was it like then portraying... Um, is it Ajax? How do you pronounce it? Ajax. Ajax. Yeah, yeah, not Ajax. Yeah, because yeah. to Tottenham Ajax <laughs> is on right now, just for context. Oh, snap, it's on now. It's on right now, yeah. Oh, gosh, what's the score? Uh, when I left, it was 1-0 uh, Ajax, so 2-0 on aggregate. I want yeah. Ajax to go through. Yeah, me too. That, <laughs> of course. I'm <laughs> um, I've got a lot of love for Tottenham and Pochettino and what he's doing. And Son is one of my favourite players. Son, I'm, I'm jealous so that Son admirable. plays for Tottenham. Yeah, he's such an admirable player. Yeah. Although he did do a really funny ice cream advert I don't know if you saw it no yeah google it and anyone listening google Son South Korean ice cream K-pop it is so funny man oh I think it's I might have comedy. seen that he's like yeah. dancing in the thing and it's so kitsch but yeah, it's yeah. funny as hell but um, <laughs> it makes him even more likeable yeah he's a super likeable guy man yeah it's annoying that he plays for Tottenham um, yeah so Ajax yeah yeah <laughs> what was it like uh, playing him um, in Deadpool I mean, you know, when we talk about like this seven and a half years since like even meeting my agent and that, yeah. and then, you know, it's only been like six and a half years since the my first movie came out. It's like I've already got to tick off some proper bucket list it's shit. It's crazy. And like not just work, but work on IP that is so close to my heart. Mm. You know, like I used to read Deadpool. I've read the X-Men and, you know, we've been collecting comics since I was 10 years old. This is my shit, <laughs> you know. That's Same mad. way, like Barry Jenkins, like is my favorite filmmaker, yeah. and you know I could have had a successful career for my whole, for the next twenty years, and you know made some money and got some respect and all that. But I would have got to the end of it and been like, yeah, but all I ever wanted, really wanted to do was make a Barry Jenkins movie, mm. and be in a Barry Jenkins movie. And it's like so, Deadpool and if Bill Street could talk, yeah, I like. Bucket list. Bucket list shit. And I, I, I can't <coughs> believe they even happened. The like timing. It, the timing's crazy. It's a dream. It's, it's just a dream. And not, not just that, but that they were executed so well. I was yeah. worried about taking on the Deadpool thing because I was like, I'd, I don't want to be a part of something shit mm. with, 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 you know, intellectual property that I love so dearly and I'm so invested in. But at the same time, it's like, you know, they should be hiring people like me who, who are invested um in the in the in the material that's right yeah. um so and it just so happened everyone involved was was invested in it and it was lightning in a bottle and it's almost like the type of thing that may never happen ever again in my career yeah i'm aware of you know it's kind of like them them cup them leicester premiership wins where like at, they get to the end of it and people like danny Drinkwater are like wow yeah I feel like I could win the league every season now, but I know intellectually I probably, <laughs> this is it. This is it, yeah. Yeah, that was amazing and that was an anomaly. Um, and uh, so that was just so special, man. It was amazing. And, you know, I made like lifelong friends with Tim Miller, the director. I was with him in the edit. Oh, for, brilliant. For a couple of days ago and went to, you know, he's a, a brother and a friend and he's kind of a, a mentor for me, actually, and there someone that... Um, a confidant we're both kind of confidants for each other and so you know it was it was an amazing experience man brilliant, brilliant. yeah that's brilliant man Proper. and also i heard on um one of the, the press junkets that mm. 
Ryan Reynolds was trying to get this made for like 11 years. Mm. So, you know, you came onto the scene at the perfect time. Perfect timing. It's crazy. It's nuts. It's crazy, man. And when you think about like the kind of worldwide search that they're doing for that and all that, and I just couldn't believe they gave it to me. Yeah. I'm like, what? What you did trust when... me? <laughs> I still had big imposter syndrome then. Yeah. Yeah, that I had to fire on that job. That job was a big one for kind of getting over the imposter syndrome. Mm. I was going to ask when that actually switched for you. Yeah, I'd say I'd say like Deadpool was the beginning of it switching, but I would say um actually like it officially went um I'd say when I did Maleficent mm. last year, you know. And, um, so, so just for context, that's seven years after your first movie. Yeah, that the imposter sy- syndrome kind of switched off. Yeah, was was officially off, yeah. and I was like, oh, let's have it. Yeah. I'm here, and I deserve to be here. Good. And I'm still humble, but I'm uh, but I'm fucking. I, I I have my seat at the table, and I deserve it. Mm. Um, yeah, like that 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 you know, it it they came a point kind of after Deadpool where I started to work with um, a higher caliber or more recognized caliber of actor. Yeah. Um, You know, and Elite, a battle angel, I got to work with Christoph Waltz, Jackie O'Haley, Jennifer Connelly, you know, Mahershala Ali. Um, Mad. (laughs) And then, you know, to go on to um, uh Maleficent, you know, my first day was a, a well, my first day was, I, sh- I can't really say too much about it, but my first day was just me and Angelina, mm. you know, and then my next day is me doing like a four page monologue to Chiwetel Ejiofor and the rest of the guys, you know, all these Oscar winners, Oscar and, winners, yeah, and, and, and nominees, people that I respect and, and look up to, and I know how much I can learn from. So, um, and Michelle Pfeiffer. You know, had a scene with her, and then like you've grown up watching on in movies proper, for, for years. You know, and then went on to Midway, um, Woody Harrelson, Patrick Wilson, Luke Evans. You know what I mean? So this is like so so. You know, it was going to go one way to, one way or the other with the imposter syndrome. Once I started sparring yeah. with these guys, I was either going to crumble and be like, "Oh snap! Like, look, this is why I'm not ready to train with the heavyweights." Mm ready to spar with the heavyweights or I was going to get in there and start being like, oh, I feel good. I Mm. feel light. My footwork's never been better. And I'm learning from you. Let's go, you know? And um, and start getting a bit of flair doing the Ali shuffle and that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So so yeah, that, it really has shifted in the last in the last couple of jobs. And, and, And that's a nice feeling because it just feels like I can I can take the reins off now, mm. you know? On Alita, I felt really liberated. And a lot of people said that with the performance, that how much fun it looked like I was having, because I really was. Mm. Deadpool was the first job I started to have fun with, and so there are moments you can see I was having fun, right? especially in the stuff we shot in reshoots. But Alita, I was having a wild old time. Robert Rodriguez just made me feel so confident, and he's like a good friend, and he's but a bro. He's one of us, man. He's cut from the same cloth. Yeah. He's just got a cowboy hat and cowboy boots on and is a, you know... A He's a massive inspiration. Tex-Mex guy. No, nah, yeah. man. And even when you talk about... Not Tex-Mex, sorry. A Mexican... <laughs> Tex-Mex. Texan. Yeah. Um, Natural. Yeah. Really. <laughs> you know what I mean? Probably disrespect <laughs> the guy and his culture. Um, but he is like, you know, he's like... He's got that entre- street entrepreneurial thing mm. going on. And, he, you know, the rebel without a crew thing is the energy that I talk about in the UK hip hop scene. Yeah. That's what I learned from the UK hip hop scene, you know? So it was just, um, so yeah, he made me feel so confident and I was just having a fucking blast, man. I was a bit worried when after I did it because I thought, shit, was I too hammy? Did I uh, go too big? Yeah, yeah. Was I too theatrical? You know, if I'm, I'm ever in doubt, I always try and play the subtle nuance thing and, and, and play things small. It's always been my approach and my kind of acting style if I've had one. Mm. But when I I was relieved when I saw it that you know that either I didn't go too big or they just used the edits <laughs> the bits <laughs> where worked. I wasn't too big and um, that gave me confidence. So when it came to like Maleficent, I was having it. Right. I was having it, you know, and um, yeah, working with people like Angie, it just you know, she fills you with so much confidence and you know, there's just so much to learn from these guys. You know, That's the, it. the energy that they contain and the quantifiable human 
uh, energy that they emit. Mm. You know, she yeah, she has like a million, um, a megawatt smile, you know, but her energy is that too. Mm. You know, these people are, it's quantifiable. I can remember first time, like we, we um, won a MTV movie award for the fight, me and Ryan, we went to the yeah, thing right. and picked up the award and that. And I remember seeing Charlize Theron in the flesh there and Halle Berry and being like, oh wow, you actually look like you're from another planet. <laughs> like there is like a ray of light on you. Like you did, you, you're movie stars. Yeah. You know? Um, and it was quantifiable when they were giving their speeches and all of that. I was like, oh my God, I think I should have written a speech. <laughs> She's talking about like beautiful charity shit and all yeah, of this. And yeah. she's clearly got this she's prepared. down and prepared. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to just freestyle it and big up the um, stunt coordinators. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> this is levels, you know. Right. But, but you know, so Angie Angie has, has got that, you know, Chiwetel has, has this amazing, quiet strength and energy and intelligence. Um that I was able to learn so much from watching, you know, and again, people like Christoph Waltz on the Lita is like, you know, One just watching actors, him block. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just seeing how uh, economical he is with his mm-hmm. um, choices and with what he does and how present he is, mm. um, albeit a very overused word. Um, yeah, he, 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 it's been amazing. But, you know, it's like, that's the other thing I say and really fucking mean when I speak to young creatives, it's like, be a sponge. It's not good enough for you to just be there. It's not good enough for you to think, oh, I'm on, I'm sharing the stage with Christoph Waltz and Jennifer Connolly, so I made it, innit? I deserve to be here, I'm cool. No, learn from them. How can you improve? Like, the, 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 it doesn't mean you're all equal because you're all on the same stage and, mm. and, and we're not in the same race as them anyway. You're yes. in your own race and your own path. And so it's like, be a sponge. The way that I've been able to improve is just by analysing, going home, being like, huh, that's how Barry got that out of me. That's how he does that. That's right. different from how Robert does that. And oh, <laughs> Roland Emmerich does it this way. Mm. Huh, why doesn't he do that? How did that make me feel as an actor when he didn't do that? When he did do that, how did that make me feel? What's my favoured process? What, what, you know, how did it, how is this making other people feel? Um, how does a set work? All of these different um, things going on, like, you know, there's so much going on, so much dynamics and so much to learn that like, I, I feel there is no excuse but to, but to listen, look and learn at every opportunity, mm. you know, and I've done that and I'm continuing to do that. And I'm so excited to how much more there is to learn. You know, yeah. I'm going to New York um, next week to work with some amazing actors. Um, and I'm just like, wow, what am I going to learn from them? Yeah. What are they going to teach me? You know, what's the experience? We shot Beale Street in New York for a couple of days, but what's it going to be like being on location in Brooklyn, on location in um, Manhattan? And, you know, this new director who's the writer as well, it's like there's always interesting things to learn when you have... It's very illuminating when the director is also the writer and stuff. So it's like the beautiful unknown, man. I'm yeah. so excited That's by really everything good. else that I have to learn. And I just know it's just a level up, level up, level up, you know, until... Yeah, until yeah, until we become like the Mo Salah, you know, <laughs> just on instinct, just rolling past people in top corner and still smiling and yeah, looking yeah. relaxed the whole time. You know what I mean? I say, how how did that happen? How did you do that? It's, it's playing the game, man. Playing the game, yeah, man. Playing Try the my game. best. <laughs> That's incredible. I had a question about um, you working alongside so many great artists. Um, is there a piece of advice that has resonated with you most from from some of those people? Because even on Alita, like James Cameron was the was the writer, right? And these yeah, are like he was an amazing legends. guy. He was an amazing guy, very intense and very intelligent. Um, first time I met him, we were playing with a baby kangaroo. Yeah, me, in, James in Cameron, country. and a baby kangaroo in um, Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. at Robert Rodriguez's studio. Yeah, that was surreal. 
Um, <laughs> first time I ever met a baby kangaroo. Cute little thing though, man, jumping around and that. Yeah. Um, I mean, in ter- like all of them, well, you don't always get direct advice off them. You know, mm. a lot of the time it's just speaking to different actors and, 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 and people. And not always like the most famous people as well. Like, you know, sometimes just speaking to producers and first ADs and, you know, yeah. the runners and everyone, just learning from everyone. But um, I think, I think like Robert Rodriguez really empowered me while I was over there to feel like just go and fucking do it mm. everything we've read from his books like he embodies that you know I was speaking to him a lot about the short film that I'd written at the time and was planning on, on directing and he's just like do it go home and do it you're ready go home right. and shoot it and anything you don't learn either reshoot anything you don't like you either reshoot it or you learn for next time and just do it and so he he really filled me with this kind of you know confidence to 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 shed the chains and um and go after things as a writer and director and I did that straight afterwards and that really boosted my confidence as well but um yeah I don't know about individual mm. advice I just think there's there's just it's just so much that goes into it yeah that it's just like I'm trying to learn about every side of it it's like when it comes to the press you know I look at who's the best people at promoting movies. Mm. Well, that's how I have to be. Who's the most interesting performers on camera? You know, Jack Nicholson, Steve Buscemi, whoever. That's who I want to be like, you know. Who's had the most nuanced, interesting um, careers? You know, um, Harvey Keitel, um, even like, you know, Michael Fassbender, people like that. You say, mm. okay, Tom Hardy, whatever, that's who we're going to follow. Who's the most gracious people that we I hear about on set? George Clooney, the most polite. Okay, well, that's how I have to be. Who's the best at doing photos and doing, and doing um, you know, that kind of like superficial side of things? That's how I have to be. Mm. You know, who who's the best at action movies? I can do that. Right. Who's the best at art house movies? Independent shit. Christoph Waltz. On, well, let me do that. Let me learn that. Mm. You know, Who's combining social philanthropy and charity work and positive community work with acting? Well, that's my responsibility. That's what I have to do, you know? So it's like really looking at this as like a embodiment of the whole thing rather than just like being an actor. Yes. And all of this encompasses the role of an actor. But um, most people are overlooking it or thinking that part of being an actor is like hitting the club. Mm. is being on Insta, is doing all this shit. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. Like, I'm seeing O's and ones, and I'm not seeing that as an important part of, like, my the coding for what I need to do. Yes. That seems irrelevant. In fact, that seems like it's just going to dissipate my energy. So, you know, I stay clear of that shit. Mm. When I'm shooting, I'm not fucking about, you know... It's game time. Messing around. Nah, I'm mm. focused. Like, yeah, it'd be nice if, like, we we can catch a little juice at some point on the shoot or whatever. But, like, really and truly, you know, I read the script every day I shoot. Every day. The same pre- script. The same script that I'm shooting for, I read it over and over. Not just your part, and the over. full script. Everything. Mm. And I'll read just my parts as well. Yeah. And I'll read, you know, specific... I'm just constantly rereading and working on all of this. So it's like, I'm trying to leave... Trying to... Trying to um, you know, have the total optimization of, 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 of the role that I can be in and maximize it and, and kind of personalize it to my energy and what I want out of life and what actually makes me happy as well, mm. you know? Because this is a job which like seems good for other people and kind of in many ways is like a service job to other people. Like I'm working 18 hour days, getting up at three in the morning. Uh, yes, to make money for myself, but like, I'm away from my family it's not always fucking fun. It's really hard work. Yeah. I'm away for four months doing this, grinding it out so that you lot can eat popcorn and enjoy it for 90 minutes. Like, it's a service industry to a point and a lot of people are in it mm. because they want the adoration of other people. Like, oh, wow. You know, but for me, it's like, this is my reality, isn't it? So I'm like, I want to enjoy the four months I'm there. I want to enjoy getting up at three in the morning. Enjoy four hours in a prosthetics chair. Enjoy 12 hours on set. Enjoy the hour D-rig. Enjoy going home to analyse the script again. Enjoy the press. Enjoy all of this. So really making it work for me 
and not getting caught up in um in 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 anything outside of what I need to do. Mm. It's a really great perspective to have, I think. For sure. I think if you can enjoy the work, which is everything you just said, mm. it 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 just makes it easier and you get a lot more value from it. And you're gonna mm. bring a better person mm. to the to the job as well. You know? I think so. I think it's kinda of like working out, man. Like I love training. Yeah. You know, I love physical training. I love martial arts. I love giving everything and putting myself in into that position of physical struggle and whatnot. But it's like, if you enjoy training and you approach it with relish mm. and you're like, I am going to beast myself, yeah, before you know it, you'll look like a fucking Spartan warrior. Mm. You'll be ripped to shreds. But you don't, if you train to get ripped to shreds, you ain't going to look like a Spartan warrior because you weren't on the sacred path. That's right. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't for for, for the right reasons. So it's like, that's the other thing that I've kind of clocked early on was like, keep it sacred. Just keep it sacred. Mm. Man. Keep everything you do sacred. And like people see, it seems to resonate with people um, that, that is sacred and it seems to feel sacred to the viewer. And then it becomes like, yeah, you create some sacred shit. And that's mm. like beautiful. That's what we're all trying to do. You know, one day I'll be off this planet. I'll leave this planet behind. And like my morals will have, um, you know, had an imprint on this planet and my um, seeds, my family will will, will, will um, continue whatever morals that I've set forth. Mm. Um, but my art's going to live forever, you know? So let me create, try and create some sacred shit. Yeah. Even if it's within the realm of something slightly frivolous, mm. you know, I'm not, I don't only have to make deep shit. You know, and also I wouldn't be able to make a living only making deep shit. Sure. Plus, life is not just life deep is not shit. exactly. You know, exactly. We have to find shit. So yeah. Do some frivolous dumb shit, and so. But even when I'm doing the frivolous dumb shit, keep it sacred. Mm. Do it with a sacred approach, you know, and um, and that served me so well. And sometimes when I go and do talks to like actors and actors classes and community and youth centers and stuff, I know I come across a little intense and a little crazy, kind of like hippie fundamentalist <laughs> whatever but I'm like like that sacred shit especially in an age where things aren't sacred mm. like it really stands out people can smell it you know and and so um, yeah I, 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 you know I, maybe it's just not in everyone's um, instinct and taste to be that way but like I think it would help so much people they would get so much further if they did it that way man. I think so and so much more fulfillment yeah yeah you know definitely and your eyes are open the whole the whole uh, experience and the whole journey like you said you're speaking to to runners and um, people on set and mm. things like that because there's so much to learn like mm. the film is not going to happen without that person mm. the film's not going to happen w without me as well mm. but it's it's a collaborative thing and it's I just feel that you've you've carried that humility with you throughout the whole time and mm. that's what's kind of I don't know yeah bringing bringing your skills to the to the table but mm. also it's probably like endearing and more opportunities and, and stuff are coming from that from that yeah, energy I think as well I don't really understand that like just playing the good game like mm. being good like I try to tell my boy my eight year old like be polite to yeah. your teachers like you'll get away with shit <laughs> you know what I mean always say please and thank you and be gracious and, and if your teacher tells you off, just say sorry. Yeah. And just like acknowledge it and try and see what they were talking about. Even if you don't agree with it, just try and like yeah. be gracious and just like play the game. Mm. You know, like when we was kids and we shoot ourselves in the foot on some pride shit, some testosterone masculine shit. Yeah. And like how many of my friends, how many of our people are in prison mm. for, for exactly that? And it's like, you know, or how many of us have just been held back because we just lost jobs or we gave up relationships because we were like, nah, fuck you, you can't speak to me like that. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, no one speaks to me like that. <laughs> and it's like, but we're speaking to them like that too. Mm. You know? And, 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 and so, this kind of, yeah, just trying to be, trying to be humble and positive and gracious and strong moraled in a world that is not humble and is flimsy moraled and is ungracious. Mm. Is, is is a challenge, but it's a proper rewarding challenge. 
And it's the way to go, man. I'm telling you. Absolutely. It makes us stand out even more. And, um, you know, we ain't doing it so that we can stand out. But um, it is. It, it helps, man. Definitely. It helps. Definitely. On that point, um, you... Where is it? Da, 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 da. Yeah, so talking about being on a sacred path and humility, you walked away from a role in Hellboy um, so that an Asian actor could be cast appropriately. So that's a massive statement of who you are, I think, um, as a part, as a person and what you stand for. Um, can you tell me how you made that decision and how the conversation went with those that were involved? Yeah, it was, you know, it was a role I was really looking forward to doing. Being a comic book. Yeah, fan. like Hellboy and the mm. character was wicked and yeah. I was really excited to do it and I was, my missus was pregnant with my second child at the time. And they were really accommodating like the, with the dates, the producers and stuff. So I already had built up all this goodwill with the producers where I was like, man, I feel wanted. And I feel like, you know, a lot of love. So, but as soon as they announced it, come out in the press and people was like talking about Scarlett, Matt, um, Tilda and Ed and like putting me as the next one in line for this whitewashing thing. Right. And, you know, I understand that the, the media machine is like, unforgiving and unfair in many ways and such and that like sometimes innocent people need to kind of fall victim for the needle of progress to move somewhat but I felt like this is not happening mm. not me you know I don't live in Beverly Hills in just like a white neighborhood that and my kids in private school and just all of this like I'm in Hackney my kids are mixed race most of my nephews and nieces are mixed race yeah all my best friends like we're multicultural you know um, I was raised by, you know, Muslims and Christians and Greek Orthodox and everything like, you know, so it was, um, there was just no way yeah. I was going to let that run. And then it was like, well, how do we approach this? And it was like, well, first of all, it's simple. We step away. Mm. Like that was just the simplest thing from the beginning. It was like, yeah. And I spoke with my team. Uh, my agents who as I say are strong moral good human beings and before anything weren't trying to grab the money and there was like you know serious money involved in this more money than I'd ever earned before yeah but I was like the way I quantified it to my agents I was like well I haven't got a penny of this I haven't been paid and got to give the money back right I never got paid because mm. I ain't done, even started the job so yeah it's just like fake imaginary money yeah, that I'm giving yeah. up I'm not yeah. giving no money back so cool I don't need this. You know what I'm saying? I've always been confident in that regard as well, that like no job is the be all and end all. Mm. And then, so then it was just about speaking with my team about the best way. They were like, how do you want us to do it? Do you want the producers to, to do a, um, a statement? I was like, no, I need to write the statement. So then I spoke with my team, which was, so I said, I'm going to, so I said to my team, let me go away and write the statement and then I'll bring it back to you. And with my publicist, we can edit it and blah, blah, blah. You can edit it down. And so me, so I spoke to Ben, Plan B. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Riz Ahmed, yep. um, who was in Ill, Ill Manners with me, like, you know, my first acting partner, yeah. first mentor as such in acting, and someone who, who's, you know, um, doing wonderful things in terms of representation and Definitely. Um, cultural equality. Um, and I spoke with my brother and I spoke with my dad. That was it. Mm. And within an hour or so, I'd carved it out. And all of them were like, yeah, maybe do this or your thing, check it, you know. I, I don't think you should say this. This makes it seem like your thing. I'm like, cool, but I want to say that and right. this and that. And by the end of it, I was like, yeah, great. This is truly my words and my voice. And um, I just needed them to make sure that I wasn't saying anything stupid yes. or that would get caught up the wrong way. Yeah. And then, um, and so that was that. It was it was a really simple, straightforward thing. Sent it to the, the 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 producers, and then you know put the tweet out, and it was amazing how 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 it was received and how positive, um, how it made people feel. And then you know I met with Daniel Day Kim, who took the role, um, who was cast in the role, and we met and became friends. And oh, when brilliant. I was out in Hawaii filming Midway, we met out there. He lives out there. Oh, dope. So we're friends, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. The story just everything played out how it was supposed to play out, mm. you know? So when you go with instinct and when you take time to look at things objectively without self-pity or without delusion and arrogance, 
then like, you know, the, 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 the clear path, the right path presents itself. And I was willing to get a backlash from that statement, but I didn't care because mm. I stand by that. And that is truly me. And so if people didn't agree with it or if I was going to get some shit for it or whatever, I just didn't know because I've never released a fucking public statement yeah, before. You yeah, know what exactly. I mean? And this is not my realm. Even like, <laughs> I just about send five tweets a year, <laughs> you know, and they're usually just saying much love to or thanks to you lot for helping with this or whatever. Right, but, right. So I was really, I was not, it wasn't, being in the public realm like that was not somewhere I was comfortable and happy being, but I just wanted to make sure it was on my terms and it was something I agreed with, man. And, and you know, subsequently everywhere I go in the world, like I hear some, I, I've been told some positive shit and people made me so happy. And it's like, that's where this thing blurs and where the more power that I get, the more responsibility I get, the more I can help with progress and be an ally to everyone and help improve um, my, and while I'm on this journey of self-discovery and self-improvement, um, self-illumination, that I can help to do that with other people and help the community and be an inspiration and be something positive, you know? And it don't take much, does it, mm. you know? It doesn't, it, it doesn't take that much and I just do what I can. And, you know, that kind of the whole thing turned into some massive fiore of the, of the world talking about it and it trending and that. But it was a simple thing for me. I just spoke to my four closest people, wrote out 140 characters and sent it off. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and then didn't tweet again for about six months. <laughs> um, yeah, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm out. I'm not getting involved in nothing. I'm out of the game. You yeah. Yeah. No, that's incredible, though, man. That's yeah. incredible. But like I said, it's it's a very it's a statement of of who you are as a person. Definitely, I think you've definitely carried that that thread. And yeah, I'm excited for for what's next in that regard. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Like I'm definitely not on standing on uh, a soapbox shouting and preaching to the world. You know, putting my trying to put my thoughts out onto everyone. But where I can. I'll do everything that I can. And most of my stuff is behind closed doors in the community anyway. Yeah, and it's yeah. on a one-to-one -one level, mm. you know. Um, but where I can, I want to I wanna, I wanna turn the needle and change things. And, you know, I, keep, I always think about the fact that, like, I'm always going to other cities and places. Like, what can I do in these places? Right. How can me go into New York for a month? Well, how can I contribute to New York? Mm. When I go Cape Town, what can I do there? You know, now at the same time, I do have to concentrate on my job. Like, that, that's my priority. And I've got so much bloody going on back home. I'm juggling all this. I don't want to start creating stuff that's going to impact and impede on the work I've got now, responsibilities I've got now. But, like, I'm like, I know I can do more, mm. you know, and then charity work. How, how can I focus my, whether it's time or money or whatever it is that I give, you know, what can I do? What more can I do? And I urge everyone to do more and just do the little you can. It might not even be much, but just if you can just mentor one person, help one person, give advice to this person, give an hour every month, two hours to this community group or, you know, mm. think about or just bring people into Sutton. I don't know, man, but just do what you can, man, because um, at a certain point it falls to us. It, re it really does fall to us, whether we're in a position of power or not. And then just being in a certain relative position of power, inverted commas, means that, like, we have to. Mm. We have to. And you're here with a voice on here. That's why I, that's why I said respect, you know, that you're doing this this positive um, thing, you know. So we'll be out in five minutes. Sorry, darling. We're coming now. <laughs> that's the voice that you put on. <laughs> For the house cleaners and stuff, it's like you go yeah. from uh, that, we'll be out there. Okay. <laughs> it's like a high pitch thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, bro, on that note, keep 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 going with everything positive you're doing, man. Thank you. I salute you and I appreciate you. And um, I'm a big fan of the show. Appreciate it, man. And, um, it's been a brilliant conversation. And let's link back up again. Yeah. In the future, gotta do a part two. Whenever, yeah. Yeah. And um, and yeah, more power, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Bro. All right, love, bro. Love. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.